Why is the myth dogs are colorblind so widely accepted? They do see colors, even though they have a more limited spectrum than we do. They see blue, yellow, and violet pretty well, but it's hard for them to tell the difference between orange, red, and green. So, if you want to redecorate your dog's house, maybe you should stick to purple and blue shades. Animals, plants, and humans were all actually connected and have common traits because we've all evolved from the same micro-ancestor. This would be our planet's original ancestor, Luca. This stands for the last universal common ancestor, which is a 3.8 billion year old organism. Closing the eyes can improve your memory. Let's say you want to listen to a story and see how much you can remember. Studies show that if you close your eyes and take a 15 minute rest, you'll remember it better. A good technique for when you're studying or trying to remember some boring information. The pink corner of your eye is actually the remnant of the third eyelid. We all have this mysterious membrane. The third eyelid is way more prominent in certain mammals and birds since it protects their eyes from dust. But for humans, this tissue doesn't have any particular meaning, so scientists believe we'll eventually lose it. When potatoes are exposed to too much light, they mostly turn green, whether they're in a factory, storage, or a field. This happens because they start to form chlorophyll, a pigment that gives plants green color. So when you see green potato chips, it means they were made from one of these potatoes that were exposed to light for a longer time. But just because some green potato chips made it into the bag doesn't mean you should eat them. As it turns out, the green areas on potatoes and on chips are not good for you. Nothing's going to happen if you eat one or two of these green potato chips. But if you eat too much of a green potato, you might experience some discomfort. Despite their name, some oranges are not orange. Some initially contain large amounts of chlorophyll, which makes this citrus green-colored in the first place. As it matures and ripens, the chlorophyll slowly disappears as the fruit is exposed to cool temperatures. That's when it gets its color. But this is also why, in warm areas across the world, oranges remain green. If you've ordered something small from Amazon, like a pen, a single book, or something else, you might have got it in a box that seemed way too big for your item. And it's not an accident, nor random. It's because of their complex shipping algorithm. It takes into account the size of other packages going to the same place, as well as the size of the shipping vehicle. The small item gets a box size that will fit the space inside the vehicle together with other packages and keep boxes from sliding around. Physicist and inventor Percy Spencer discovered microwaves by accident. He was building a magnetron for some of his radar equipment. At one moment, he realized the chocolate bar he had been keeping in his pocket had begun to melt. He was curious about what was going to happen next. So, he directed microwaves at eggs, which exploded, and popcorn, which popped. This is how he discovered a great tool to heat food that uses less energy than a conventional oven. In its original version, the clay-like substance we call Play-Doh today was a wallpaper cleaner. It was invented and sold for the purpose of lifting soot off of wallpaper. At the time it first showed on the market, you could only get it in an off-white color. But later, they started selling it as a toy. The substance was produced in yellow, blue, and red. Today, you can get it in more than 50 colors. Bubble wrap had a somewhat different purpose at its beginning. It was supposed to be wallpaper. In the 1950s, when it first showed up, two engineers decided to glue two shower curtains together. That's how they trapped small bubbles of air between them. They were trying to create some sort of textured wallpaper, but it didn't take off. A couple years later, IBM had to ship some data processors and needed something to protect them, which is when the phenomenon of bubble wrap came up. One study showed that one minute of popping bubble wrap is as calming as a 30-minute massage. Why don't electric fans cool the air? You could set a thermometer in front of it and choose a turbo mode. But the temperature won't go down. In fact, the temperature might even go up if you leave the thermometer next to the working parts thanks to the electric current. A fan won't cool the air, but it will cool you or any other object with water inside. An electric fan improves air circulation in a closed space. Plus, it speeds up evaporation which makes liquids, including the sweat on your skin, a bit cooler. 
Have you noticed pen caps have tiny holes on the top? It seems random at first, but it's actually a lifesaver. If you can accidentally swallow this cap, the hole ensures you can continue breathing because the cap won't completely block the airway. If you take a closer look at the night sky, you'll see stars come in different shapes and sizes. White is the most prevalent color, true, but they sparkle in shades of red, blue, and yellow too. But you won't see a green star. It's not that stars don't emit green light, it's just that our eyes don't see it like that. Stars vary in colors when they burn at different temperatures. The hottest stars appear blue, while the coolest stars seem to burn in red hues, but they all shine in multiple colors. They emit different light wavelengths that represent various parts of the color spectrum. We can't all perceive those wavelengths separately. We only see the dominant light wavelength, which means the dominant color. So, stars of medium heat emit green photons in most cases, but they just don't appear green. When we try to process something that generates red, green, blue, and yellow photons at once, our eyes see it as white. That's the same reason why mid-temperature stars such as our sun appear white to us. Why do we blink? To moisten and cleanse the eye, that's for sure. Every time you close your eyelids, the tear glands secrete a salty substance that sweeps over the surface of your eye. It then flushes away all those tiny dust particles and also lubricates the exposed parts of your eyeball. We usually blink every 4 to 6 seconds unless the eyes are more irritated. Then, we blink more frequently to keep them moist and clean. But not just that. Blinking also helps our brain to reset. It has to process so many things all the time, so it's fair to give it a break from time to time. So blinking rescues our brain around 15 to 20 times per minute. When we shut our eyes, we help our brain to power down and take a very short but still effective mental break. That's why we blink more when we're in the middle of a task that demands some serious mental activity. Why do we have nails? They're generally made of a specific type of protein you can find in fur, hair, claws, and hooves. It's called keratin, and unlike claws, nails are flat and wide, so they're more effective at shielding the tips of toes and fingers from potential injuries. Fingernails not only protect sensitive areas but also provide a rigid backing so you can take and separate small objects more easily. How would you pick up a single jigsaw piece or peel a sticker from its backing without nails? It would be almost impossible without additional tools. Apes and monkeys use their feet for such delicate tasks too. Primates have probably evolved nails because they needed help with simple tasks such as grasping branches tightly and removing ticks. Raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, and cherries are not berries. To classify a berry, they have to have three layers. A protective outer one, a fleshy one in the middle, and finally, an inner part where you can find the seeds. Also, a plant must come from a flower with just one ovary and have two or more seeds. So, by this criteria, cranberries and blueberries are berries. Together with some more plants, you wouldn't expect to be in this category. Kiwis, bananas, watermelons, tomatoes, eggplants, and even peppers. You've probably heard your ears and nose are those body parts that never stop growing. This happens because the effects of skin changes and gravity. Other parts of your body change in the same ways, but you can't see it as well as you can see what's happening with your nose and ears. So you're watching your favorite cooking show when suddenly... The star chef adds a pinch of salt to some jam that's supposed to go into a dessert. You pick up the phone to call and complain, but right then the chef explains. It turns out that adding salt to fruit is a common thing in different cuisines across the world. Like in Mexico, they like to spice up mango and citrus fruits with salt and chili powder. You can try mango with a shrimp taste in the Philippines and salted watermelon in the southern states. So how does it work? Well, let's say you're eating a raw mango sprinkled with salt. With the first bite, you notice the salty flavor, and the sweet fruity taste is then slightly delayed. It feels as juicy and amazing as ever. It's most likely because salt affects the sweet taste receptor for sugar, and then really magic happens on a molecular level. One study even found that we have more sugar detectors in our taste cells than scientists previously thought. One of those detectors must direct sugar to a sweet taste cell when it gets in contact with salt. 
You can try and put salt on any fruit you like, but the effect will be different. Salt can make sweeter fruits like cherries and strawberries even sweeter and balance the flavor of grapefruit, pineapple, and watermelon. Just take a ripe fruit and slice it the regular way and sprinkle the pieces with salt. Large, flaked sea salt might taste more intense, plus it looks more beautiful. After 10 minutes, your gourmet dessert will be ready. So, you need to chop up a heap of iceberg lettuce, but that tough core in the middle doesn't want to leave. Just hold the lettuce head in both hands with the core end down and slam it against a cutting board or some other solid surface. Not your brother. Now, you should be able to pull the core right out of the bottom and slice the rest of the lettuce without a problem. The next time you take butter out of the fridge and struggle to spread it because, you know, it's hard as a rock, reach for your grater. With its help, you'll easily flake off tiny pieces of butter that will melt instantly on a warm toast. You can also spread them much easier on cold bread without putting your sandwich in the microwave or waiting for a while to soften the butter. Professional bakers approve of this tip and have been using it for a long time. When you're frying something, you first heat the pan and then put the food on it, right? Well, this logic won't work if you want to make your bacon crispy. On a hot pan, the meat will cook before the fat can melt out of it. Your bacon will be too fatty and rubbery. So you gotta lay the strips on a cold pan and then turn on medium-low heat. The fat will render out of the meat, and the final result will be super yummy and crispy. Have you ever tried boiling pasta in a frying pan? I know it sounds a bit weird, but it can actually help you save a lot of time, water, and energy. Instead of filling a huge pot with water and waiting for it to boil, put your pasta in a frying pan and cover it with cold water and add some salt to it. Your pasta will be cooking while the water is getting to the boiling point, so it'll be ready much faster than normal. And the water that's left in the pan will make an excellent base for a sauce because it's filled with starch. Mix it with pesto, tomato sauce, and garlic butter. Mmm, it tastes like it's straight out of a gourmet restaurant. Now, the secret to cooking the most delicious and fluffy mashed potatoes is to dry them before you mash them. After boiling, you can either put them in a pot and leave them over low heat on the stovetop, or keep them in a baking sheet in a low oven. Then add melted butter that will coat the starch in the potatoes, and only then slowly add milk. Now your mashed potatoes will have the best possible structure and flavor. If you've shed enough tears over onions when trying to slice them, this one is a must-try for you. Peel the onions, cut them in half, and leave them in a fridge in a bowl of iced water for half an hour before you start cooking. The reason behind your tears is the sulfur that onions take from the soil while growing up. When you damage its cells, the acids contact the enzymes that start a whole bunch of reactions and release a chemical that makes your eyes water. Freezing the onion can weaken that chemical. To minimize it even more, only use a sharp knife to slice onions. This way, you'll do less damage to its cells. It's much easier to peel an avocado if you freeze it first. Just put it in the fridge as it is, give it some time, and then take it out and hold it under warm running water. Now you can peel it easily after you make a couple of crisscross incisions. The best way to keep herbs fresh and juicy is to store them like flowers. If you don't have the right size vase or vase, Take a mason jar or a water glass and fill it with an inch of water. Now put the herbs inside as you would do to your roses. For parsley and cilantro, cover the jar with a plastic bag and store the bouquet in the fridge. Basil loves sunlight, so you better leave it uncovered on the counter. If you've made too much sauce or have some leftovers in a can that doesn't seem to be enough for anything, you can save it from the trash can. Pour the sauce into an ice cube tray and keep it in the freezer. Now, if you need to spice up a meal, you can always add a couple of sauce cubes to it. Plus, as a bonus, which is redundant, the sauce will last longer this way than it would in the fridge. Do your meatballs always turn out to be perfectly the same shape and size? Then skip this one. But if you're like me, just use an ice cream scoop to get the right amount of your minced meat mix. Try saying that five times. The balls will be the ideal shape and your fingers won't get sticky. The easiest and probably the most beautiful way to slice a mango is to turn it into a hedgehog. 
Wash the mango under running water. Don't squeeze it while doing it. Now put it straight up on a cutting board and cut it into three pieces from the top downwards. Just leave that flat pit in the middle piece. There isn't much you can do with it anyway. Now your mango will have two cute cheeks. I mean, its fattest parts. Next, make crosswise and lengthwise cut in the mango cheeks. Leave some even distance between the incisions and don't go all the way through the skin. Now press on the back side of the mango until the flesh pokes out. Does it look like something to you? Yep, a hedgehog. Hence the name of this slicing method. The final step will be to slice off the mango cubes into a bowl. Then eat. Now this one has all the potential to become your new breakfast favorite. You can cook an omelet in a mug. Take a large microwave-safe mug and coat the inside of it with olive oil or spray it with cooking spray. Add two eggs and one tablespoon of milk and mix them with a fork. Now add salt and pepper and any cheese, veggies, and herbs you like. Put it in the microwave on high for 30 seconds. Take it out, stir it with a fork, and then put it back for another 30 seconds. And voila! Your breakfast is served. Oh, be sure to use another mug for your coffee. Otherwise, you get eggs in your coffee, and nobody has a recipe for that. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. A beverage as black as ink, useful against numerous health conditions. It's made of water and the fruit from a bush called bunu. You must have guessed. It's a description of coffee. This is how coffee was described by a German physician who had a 10-year trip to the Near East back in the 16th century. Today, you don't have to venture into the unknown to get a cup of precious liquid. You can easily make it at home or visit the closest coffee shop. As of 2023, in the U.S. alone, there are over 72,000 coffee shops. Imagine the whole world. When you think of coffee, what's the first country that comes to your mind? Italy? Maybe France? But here's the kicker. Actually, Finland is the coffeeest country in the world. Just picture it. An adult Finn consumes up to 27.5 pounds of coffee per year while an American only consumes about 11 pounds. Norway proudly takes second place, and Denmark closes the top three. Italy and France aren't even in the top 10. And by the way, each day, people on our planet drink approximately 1.6 billion cups of coffee. If you're planning to hit some longevity records, coffee may come in handy. There's been research conducted by Harvard Health Publishing stating that those who drink three to four cups of coffee per day are more likely to have a longer lifespan. Sounds cool, but it's probably not the best option. One of the world's most famous super centenarians, Jeanne Calmun, acknowledged that she would drink coffee with milk for breakfast. And she lived an incredibly long life of 122 years. Not only do people prove that coffee helps with longevity, but cats can also prove it. This is Cream Puff from Texas. It's the cat that lived for 38 years. Jake Perry, Cream Puff's owner, shared some details about his pet's diet. Cream Puff would typically eat dry cat food, eggs, turkey bacon. All right, nothing special here. But the cat was a big fan of coffee too. Cream Puff preferred coffee with cream. Now, here's a question for you. What color is your coffee mug? Thing is, it matters a lot what you drink from. There are certain colors, for example, lead-based glaze that can release toxic substances in your drink. Mugs glazed with red and orange are most likely to contain lead. So if you want to play it safe, opt for mugs made of glass, ceramic, or stainless steel. Also, mugs made of plastic or aluminum aren't safe either, as they may release unwanted substances, just like glazed mugs. But the color matters for psychological reasons too. There's been an experiment concerning coffee perception based on the mug color. So, it turns out that if we drink coffee from a white mug, it may seem less sweet than if we drink it from a blue or transparent one. Coffee even played an important role in major sports events. Back in 1932, Brazilian athletes couldn't afford a trip to LA to participate in the Olympic Games. However, a solution was found. 
The authorities loaded the athletes onto a ship full of coffee. That coffee was sold on the way, so it helped finance their trip. Coffee is also the key to a happy family life, or at least it used to be. In the 15th century in Mesopotamia, coffee was pretty important when it came to marriage. Men would choose their future wives based on how well they could make coffee. Luckily, we have coffee machines for that today, so we choose partners based on their personalities. And in Constantinople, a wife could file for divorce in case her hubby did not provide her with enough coffee. According to industry standards, you need around 56 coffee beans to make a single shot of coffee. Beethoven, yes, I'm talking about one of the main hit makers of all time, would count 60 beans precisely to brew his morning coffee. I guess it was more of a ritual than a particular recipe. Hey, do you have any rituals for your morning, Joe? Another hit maker, Johann Sebastian Bach, even dedicated a cantata to coffee, which he called coffee cantata. Pretty straightforward, huh? The cantata tells about coffee dependence. Even though black coffee is supposedly the most common type out there, pretty much everyone tried cappuccino at least once. By the way, it got its name because of the final color the drink has. It's a soft brownish shade, very much similar to the color of the capuchin robe. Plus, the robe has a hood, and the word hood translates to Italian as cappuccio. Now the name finally makes sense. Those who don't like to spend time brewing coffee often opt for the instant variety. Let's say happy birthday to instant coffee. It's soon to turn 116 years old. It was invented in 1907, and up until the 1970s, many consumers would criticize it for having an inferior taste. However, in the 1970s, the technology changed, and the manufacturers claimed it tasted almost like freshly brewed coffee. Also, instant coffee created another popular thing, coffee vending machines. The first prototype was invented back in 1947, and they've been with us ever since the 1950s. There are also some products you don't really want to combine coffee with. Number one, meat. The logic is simple. Coffee can absorb zinc in the body. Therefore, it's not the best choice to have coffee after grabbing something that contains zinc. I'm talking about red meat, oysters, and beans. Number two, fried food. Such dishes tend to contain a lot of so-called bad fats. And once you combine them with caffeine, this mix increases the cholesterol levels in your body. Number three may come as a surprise, but still, coffee and milk aren't the best match. Coffee doesn't let the calcium absorb, so technically, you just don't get many nutrients from the milk. Japan seems like the perfect place for those who love coffee. I mean, do you know any other place where you can literally bathe in coffee? Me neither. So this hot springs spa and water amusement park near Tokyo got famous for its extraordinary hot tubs. There are 26 baths in total, and they're filled with coffee, green tea, and many other drinks. Only fresh ingredients are used, and the baths get refilled every day. So to make a coffee tub, they brew coffee beans with water from natural hot springs. By the way, the price is pretty reasonable. An adult ticket costs about $36. If you tried to make a coffee tub yourself, you'd probably spend more. Time to debunk another myth. Decaf coffee does have caffeine. A middle-sized decaf drink has about 7 milligrams of caffeine, while regular coffee has about 7. Yep, 10 times less, but it's enough to disrupt your sleep. As for classic coffee, remember that caffeine has a 6-hour half-life, so it takes about 12 hours to fully eliminate it from your body. Coffee is a no-go both before you go to sleep and right after you wake up. Cortisol, the stress hormone, is not only responsible for stress, but for sleep cycles too. It spikes between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., so a cup of coffee only adds to anxiety in the morning. Grab it when the cortisol is at its lowest. It also spikes between noon and 1 p.m. and between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m. No coffee at this time. Many people believe coffee is not the healthiest drink, opting for good quality water or other beverages. Still, if you just can't say no to your guilty pleasure, try buying a thermocup and brewing coffee at home. 
you'll save money and nature since the disposable coffee cups aren't recyclable and it takes at least 20 years for them to decompose. A pop-in in a coffee shop may be your daily ritual, but have you ever counted how much you spend on your morning habit? Millennials spend over $2,000 a year on coffee, investing sometimes more than they do in their retirement. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.